The following is a conversation with Virendra Singh Rathor. Virendra is an IT professional and a researcher of history who specializes in the history of the Rajputs. He has written a book, Prithviraj Chauhan, A Light on the Mist in History, which aims to dispel the myths and controversies around the famous Chauhan King's life and events. The following conversation is centered around his research on Prithviraj Chauhan's life and career. So my first question to you, Virendraji, is uh, what was your motivation for writing the book that you wrote? So you've written a book about Prithviraj Chauhan. It's one of the few books that we find in the market about this very significant king of the past mm -hmm. at least thousand years of our history. So what yeah. motivated you to write this book? Uh, my motivation was that uh, Prithviraj Chauhan is not only a famous figure uh, in our history, uh, he is as controversial as he is famous. And uh, his own motivation factor, or should I call it, uh, you know, the, the, the way he really revolutionizes our perception toward history, the, you know, uh, the way his history is understood and talked about, uh, that, that's one important thing. But there are as many controversies or myths around him. And that is what really, you know, prompted me to study a bit and try to understand where the truth lies and if possible, try to dispel the myths. So that's where I started. And um, honestly, it, it uh, you know, it, it was never planned that I would write a book or something. I just started writing a blog post. So then it, it got a bit long. I thought, okay, maybe a series of articles. And I think I was almost halfway through it when I realized that, okay, uh, this is something different. So it, it just happened by accident. I, I was just trying to, you know, iron out a couple of myths and turn into a book. So when did you start writing the article, so to say, and how long did the entire process take? I, I think it was around the start of COVID uh, when I started. Um. So yeah, within a year, I would say, uh, and uh, think uh, in September, October, it was it was released the book, uh, twenty twenty. So yeah, a few months, uh, close to a year, you can say, or more than half a year. Yeah, I see. And and what methodology or philosophy did you approach, or did you take in writing the book? What sources did you consult? Uh, I consulted nearly everything uh, which was within my reach, like the Islamic sources, uh, as well as Indian sources, epigraphy, coinage, literary sources, you know, the contemporary ones, the bardic ones, which came later, almost everything. And um, methodology wise, I, I would say, um, so I tried to uh, come out chronologically, you know what happened first and then what happened, then what happened. And alongside, I tried to, you know, pick up and cover each and every myth that I encounter or each and every controversy. So one thing that I've done is uh, places where I was not able to conclude that, okay, this is the truth or this is not the truth. This is false. This is right. This is myth. Uh, I have given the facts and arguments uh, which are, you know, kind of both sides of the story. And then I left it for my readers to form their own conclusions. I, I did not try to shove my own half-baked opinion or anything like that uh, to the readers. So so that that's the methodology that I uh, tried to follow. So it was basically just a book to uh, dispel the myths or, or answer the controversies. Yeah. Right. So did you already have the answers or did you discover the answers as part of the writing process? Partly I already had the answers and partly mm. I did discover uh, while researching. Like, uh, for example, there was an engagement between Prithviraj Chauhan and Muhammad Ghori before the Tarain battles. This is something I didn't know uh, until I started the uh, search. And a couple of things I understood beforehand, like the case of uh, Jaichand being a traitor was not true. The case of Sanyogita being a historic figure is on very weak grounds. So there were a couple of things that I already knew. So yeah. Very interesting. 
right so let's let's begin with a little bit of context and background could you give us a brief background or uh, understanding of the chauhan dynasty or clan who are these uh, who are these chauhan rajputs what's their origin supposed to be like and uh, what's the background to prithviraj's uh, birth and life sure sure so chauhan is basically uh, an upper branch of a sanskrit word chahaman now uh, chahaman is said to be the name of the progenitor of the clan the mool purush and um, if you see his history it's uh, the data is a bit sketchy but we can have a reasonable uh, you know uh, idea about him he belongs to the 6th century ad Uh, around the same time when the uh, hunas were being uh, you know thrown out of india uh, by the uh, olikars of malwa so that's where you can anchor chahaman the uh, progenitor of this clan so the prithviraj vijay says uh, <clears throat> it's a contemporary text written during the reign of uh, prithviraj chauhan only so that text says uh, that uh, the father of chahaman uh, who was named i think virochan his elder brother dhananjay and chahaman himself the three of them uh, fought the um, i think it said like asuras or malechas or something like that they said and uh, it, this basically coincides with the uh, olikar struggle with the hunas the reason being um, if you trace back from the first inscription of the chauhans which are the uh, hansot plates uh, from there if you come back a few generations uh, they they have basically given a genealogy of six uh, generations i think uh, which takes us up to vajradam and then from there if you dial back a few more generations to reach chaman you come around the same time when this uh, hun olikar clash was happening okay so from there this uh, clan slowly grew up and um, around the time of uh, nagabhat pratihar when the arabs were uh, defeated uh, at that time they were like you know feudals a samant level power and then when the pratihars declined toward the 10th century around 999 ad the end of 10th century around you start seeing the chauhan kings uh, taking boastful and independent titles in their inscriptions so that's where they really came out of the shadow of pratihas and then um, you know you can see throughout the 11th and 12th century there were frequent uh, conflicts between the various chauhan kings and the muslim invaders coming in from the northwest so that's how it basically comes and in the 12th century uh, you would see the establishment of ajmer as a capital by ajara chauhan and uh, yeah couple d- generations down uh, below the line you have uh, prithviraj chauhan so that that's the a bit of ancestry yeah and uh, so what was the uh, prithviraj chauhan's uh, family like i mean what kind of uh, mm-hmm. uh, environment was he was he born in was it uh, was his father already a, a, a powerful king how was it like yeah so <clears throat> his birth uh, he was born in anhil patan that's uh, oh, the, the modern patan of gujarat and um, patan happened to be the maternal home of his father so uh, someshwar chauhan's mother was uh, the solanki princess kanchan devi uh, the daughter of uh, jaisingh siddharaj solanki so um, that's where he was born and he spent the first 6 uh, years of his life in patan only as a kid along with his parents and um, it was uh, I, so if if i could come to the time of his birth i placed it in um, 1162 to 63 ad it's a bracket of 2 years i personally tend to prefer 63 but uh, yeah so there, there is a bit of uh, you know a lack of consensus on the exact year of his birth but i i tried to sort it out dedicating a whole chapter on the birth itself like when is he born because what happens is that if you don't sort out the year of birth properly the events that would happen in the following decades you can't really understand why things happened the way they did so yeah the birth was in 63 uh, 62 63 ad and uh, uh, as a kid when he grew up 
his his upbringing was like any other royal would have so he was trained in all the various arts and sciences you know uh, mimasa sangeet and everything then his daily routine was like uh, he he would go for exercises uh, often he would go for hunt and uh, he was also capable of controlling elephants so this is basically a description which is coming from uh, prithviraj vijay again which was written by a court poet like i said a contemporary text so that that that's a bit about his uh, and uh, you know in terms of physical appearance it says uh, that he he had long arms ajanu bahu and a broad chest he used to walk uh, slow with a bit of subtle uh, a gait so subtle swear kind of thing you can say so curly hair and uh, yeah i think uh, that's a bit of uh, physical description yeah so at 6 years of age the family traveled to ajmer from patan the reason being the predecessors of his father uh, someshwar chauhan they had you know one by one call it internal troubles or uh, fights or succession wars one by one they were all gone like vigrah raj chauhan then his son was there then one of his cousins uh, kind of challenged him and defeated him so uh, eventually they were all gone and around 68 69 ad uh, with no contender at the throne so the ministers called someshwar chauhan that you must come and uh, you know take the throne so that's how they reached uh, ajmer yeah i see that's very interesting this is a recurring theme among the rajputs fratricidal warfare fighting among each other so much fractiousness why has it always been this way i'm i'm taking a detour right now but could you just explain uh-huh. briefly why it's always been this way well i would say um, being kshatriyas they there is no hesitation in fight so it it's a part of power plays but when it comes to fratricide um, i won't say it was something which is peculiarly prevalent among the rajputs uh, mm. it was a feature of that era and if you look at the even if you look at the muslim rulers yeah uh, yeah you see a lot of fratricides and uh, the biggest example is aurangzeb himself so of course yes he, he, he didn't leave anybody father brother son no one <laughs> so <laughs> i i think it, it, you... it was a feature feature of that era itself yeah right so they go back to uh, ajay meru ajmer and uh, yeah. then what happens so then um, for a couple of years someshwar chauhan uh, continues uh, ruling so yeah uh, i think i missed a, a couple of parts about the family so prithviraj chauhan's uh, mother was karpuri devi uh, karpuri devi was a, a, a kalchuri princess from a place in mp i think the modern name is tevar in mp previously it was known as tripuri so she she was a kalchuri princess and um, he had uh, one younger brother um, named as hariraj chauhan so uh, coming back to the ajmer stay so uh, for few years someshwar chauhan was there on the throne and then around 1177 ad someshwar chauhan died and uh, prithviraj chauhan was uh, coronated on the throne uh, he was 14 years of age at that time for a few years his mother and the prime minister kadambavas were in a supervising role so basically that means prithviraj was not making policy decisions at least not alone but yes he was uh, taking active or full uh, part in the military exploits so soon after the coronation his uh, rule or position at the throne of ajmer was challenged by um, a cousin of his so uh, basically the elder uh, brother of uh, someshwar chauhan vigrah chauhan the fourth uh, a cousin actually Uh, from a different uh, queen of arnaraj so he had died around 1165 ad he was actually um, we i should say if not more than prithviraj then equally illustrious king a bit less known but uh, that's how it is so vigrah raj chauhan the fourth had two sons 
one was uh, gone already the younger son who was uh, nagarjun uh, nagarjun chauhan uh, so his mother was a tomar princess from delhi now they basically laid a counter claim on the throne and so nagarjun with the help of his maternal side the tomars of delhi he acquired uh, a place named gudpur uh, within the chauhan kingdom so uh, the the exact geographic identification is is uh, a bit hazy but uh, it, it was not very far from ajmer that is what is uh, surmised the, the reason being uh, the response from the side of prithviraj was very swift and very furious so he went there he attacks and uh, nagarjun what he does is uh, much to sully the name of his father he fled from the battle although his his army was uh, you know they they fought bravely uh, and uh, so then after that what prithviraj uh, does is his army they bring the um, heads of the dead soldiers enemy soldiers back to the main fort of ajmer <clears throat> and at the, the main gate they hang a, a garland of those heads also the royal ladies of uh, of the enemy's family the uh, nagarjun's family they were arrested and brought to ajmer now why did these two things happen uh, one is that uh, see when you look at any new ruler uh, as a new ruler in any kingdom your priority would be to ensure that there is no challenge to your writ to your rule because that not only destabilizes the state it it's like a, a general challenge to the overall law and order of the kingdom as well so and and we know that that was an age of frequent violence so as a new king your priority would be to set an example so that no you know rebellious elements or such people would get an idea or take it as a sign of weakness so that hanging of heads at the guard uh, you know that garland of heads at the ajmer fort's gate was done to set an example so that there are no such uh, challenges to the rule of the uh, authority of the king now coming to the arrest of the royal ladies uh, we must forget uh, must not forget that uh, nagarjun was still alive so in order to preempt any kind of recurrence of such attempts any new political alliances or you know trying to come at him again he basically uh, brought the royal women arrested so that nagarjun would not try anything and that basically succeeded he he, he was quiet for for a long time so that's the uh, early bit of uh, what really happened so what eventually happened to those royal ladies who were arrested the ones from nagarjun's family were they eventually released or what, what was their what was their fate long term i i think history is silent on that bit but uh, right. if anything untoward would have happened to them uh, i think they they would be so what has happened is so when prithviraj had, had you know basically got settled at the at, at the throne at that time the relations with the tomars were not really conducive uh, they had gone bad since the death of vigraraj chauhan so uh, till vigraraj chauhan was alive the chauhan relations with the tomars of delhi were good basically there was a Uh, a wedding he had wedded the tomar princess so after his death there was this competition of solanke influence from the south and tomar influence from the north and both parties trying to promote their own candidates on the throne right so that's where it it collided and the chauhan tomar relations were pretty bad but then gradually uh, prithviraj kind of you know he repaired his re- relations with the tomars so the way i see it is if he had done anything untoward uh, toward the you know the royal ladies of the tomar family uh, those relations would never come back on track 
Yes. And they were so well on track that you find the Tomers fighting shoulder to shoulder with Chauhans in both the battles of Tarang. So the relations which were bad till his father, Someshwar Chauhan, till he himself got coronated, they don't get repaired automatically. It was his own work. So yeah, I, I don't think anything untoward happened to them, but the, the, the history is silent about what happened to them after that. So one one can surmise that unless he had done something bad, uh, I mean, if he had done something untoward, then that would have been recorded and it would have been a permanent stain on his reputation. So clearly nothing of that sort must have happened. Permanent yeah, stain so as well as the Chauhan Tomer relations would have never gone back to normal. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is the initial phase of uh, Prithviraj Chauhan's career as a king. I mean, he's still consolidating his hold over the over power. So after yeah. that, what happens? I mean, when does he become a really powerful king, and and what are the, uh, what are the moves he makes? Right. So the first kingdom that he attacks uh, after stabilizing his hold was the uh, Bhadanats. So Bhadanats, uh, Bhadanats basically uh, straddle around the area of uh, Dholpur, Mathura, Bayana, that region. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say northeast to uh, the kingdom of uh, Prithviraj. So he attacked the uh, Vadanaks and the um, attack was largely successful because the uh, the political power of Vadanaks was uh, properly dispersed after that. But um, so this is where you you start to see one of the signs of shortcomings of Prithviraj which was that you beat your enemy, you maul him down, and yet you didn't finish him down to the dogs. So if you notice, uh, right from uh, Nagarjun, the first encounter, then the Bhadanaks, they bounce back, which, which is proven. I've, I've covered that in the book. Uh, then he attacked the um, Chandela kingdom. Okay, uh, whose king was Parmardin Chandel. Then he fought with the Solankis and their, their military confederation. Then with Gauri. You would notice that most of, if not all, most of these uh, people have outlived Prithviraj Chauhan. So what I'm trying to say is that he, he, he would fight with his enemy, he would dominate the enemy, but for some reason, and I, I won't completely call it his fault because there are some occasions where, as we'll, we'll see that, uh, that circumstances did not really allow for that. that. So basically, he would end up letting his enemy survive. So that's what happened. Uh, the Vadanaks later on bounced back. But anyway, for a few years, they were no problem for Prithviraj. So after Bhadanaks, uh, Prithviraj attacked the uh, another eastern kingdom of Chandels. So he completely, you would say, uh, you know, overpowered Parmardin Chandel, the king of uh, that kingdom. And uh, one of his inscriptions, the Madanpur inscription, is found quite deep in the Chandel kingdom. But that inscription again does not boast of any kind of land annexation. It just says that, okay, we raided the kingdom, we destroyed and we, we won it, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, so it, it doesn't say that, okay, we have won land or we have captured the kingdom. Nothing of that sort is there. And then um, if you combine this with the later bardic narrative, of Allah Khand and all, where you find the story of those Banafar heroes, Allah and Udal. So the, the, the basic idea that you can get out of it is that either Prithviraj Chauhan had, you know, he went in, defeated and came back abruptly. I'll come to that. Or the second possibility was that he concluded a treaty with the Chandels and as part of that, uh, land up to Mahoba, uh, broadly up to the Dash Dashana River, but up to Mahoba was given to Prithviraj. So 
the, the, the medieval norms are like this. Once you defeat your enemy king, one of the three things happens or a random combination of these three. You tell them to pay tributes, regular tributes. Uh, you claim war indemnities that I fought war with you and it cost me this much, this much. Or you take a part of their land that you, you give a part of your territory to me permanently. So th those kind of things, they do happen and it was not something out of ordinary. So it, it could have happened. But uh, regardless, um, we observed that that campaign did not reach a meaningful end. Prithviraj had to pull back. Why did he have to pull back? What happened was around the same time when he was conducting that campaign, the queen regent of uh, Solanki kingdom from Gujarat, Patan, uh, Naiki Devi, she asked her general Jagadev Pratihar to open a front on the Chauhan border and they penetrated near Osiyan. This again is confirmed by inscriptional evidence. So this is the jolt which basically forced Prithviraj Chauhan to recoil, come back from his Chandel campaign. He managed the affairs around Osiya and Falodi and then countered this uh, Solanki Federation at uh, Mount Abu. So what he does is he would, uh, he led a night raid, a surprise, nice, uh, surprise night attack on the Abu kingdom. So Abu kingdom was uh, governed by Parmars, a small kingdom, and they were basically feudatories of the Solankis. So that's where Prithviraj retaliated. And I think uh, for a few more years, there were some sporadic uh, clashes with the Solankis. So broadly, this is how uh, two of the main engagements happened with a uh, few other uh, you know, Hindu kingdoms. Yeah. Uh, the question is, uh, aren't night raids proscribed in the Rajput code of honor? You're not supposed to do certain things in warfare. So how did he conduct a night, ra a night raid? Right. So this is where these uh, stereotypes uh, get, get, get melted. Because mm -hmm. if you notice the real activities of Prithviraj the king, you would see that he wasn't some, you know, following some kind of outdated or uh, naive policy that, okay, I I will not kill the enemy in this way, I will not kill the enemy in that way, you know, hanging heads of the enemy uh, at your gate to send a psychological message, arresting the royal women to preempt any kind of recurrence of challenges, then conducting a night raid on the enemy, a surprise night raid. So what I'm trying to say is that he, he wasn't some out of place, overly, you know, principled person the, the man was pretty much, you know, harsh when it when the situation demanded and uh, a bit diplomatic or, you know, compromising when the situation demanded. Now, how does this part come out? When Prithviraj was having his sporadic clashes with the Solankis, somewhere around 1185 or 86 AD, Despite having an upper hand on them, Prithviraj Chauhan concluded a treaty with the Solankis. Now, why would he do that? The second part, which I was uh, going to say here, was the repairing of relations with the Tomas. These two actions of Prithviraj have taken place in the backdrop of a very serious challenge which grew up in the Northwest. What had happened was Shahbuddin Ghori, rising from his governorship of uh, Ghazni, he tried to expand Southeast and eventually he gobbled up the entire uh, kingdom of the uh, descendants of Mahmud of Ghazni. So the Ghaznavid kingdom, which, which was gradually shrinking and was mostly around Lahore, he eventually wiped off that kingdom as well. So basically, Muhammad Ghori was now a neighbor to the Chauhans and Tomars. That important development and what it meant for them, that, that was something which Prithviraj Chauhan 
easily realized that this is a serious threat developing. So that's why suddenly he concludes a treaty with the Solankis to basically silence uh, his southern border. He also repairs his relations with the Tomars, which we'll see that in the Taran battles, they fought shoulder to shoulder. So what I'm trying to say is that he wasn't some self-centered person who is just, you know, bothered about himself or his kingdom or his power or that someone who can't foresee the kind of challenges that were coming up his way. He did foresee them. And the moment Gauri acquires Lahore, you see a complete shift in the politics of Prithviraj. He had no need to conclude a treaty with the Solankis when he had an upper hand. And then he repairs the relations with the Thomas. So these actions uh, tell us that he, he, he wasn't, you know, just about fighting and fighting. Yeah. So this treaty that we had, that he had with the Thomas and the other treaty that he had with the Solankis were these different kinds of treaties. It looks to me like Prithviraj had a kind of alliance with the Thomas, but just a peace yes. deal with the Solankis. Is it true? Right. True. So he had an alliance with the Thomas, and uh, basically he hadn't been he hadn't been actively fighting the Thomas. Okay, mm -hmm. so that, that's why it was just a matter of diplomatic maneuvers and getting a decent understanding. But with Solankis, he had had fights, so it, it would have to take a, you know a formal uh, approach and you conduct the peace treaty and all because he had been fighting with them over the past few years on and off there were multiple conflicts so there it had to be a bit more formal in terms of a treaty yeah but with tomers the chauhans had a history of cooperation as well in form of vidyaraj chauhan so i would say yeah it, it didn't require a formal treaty or anything but just just a bit of diplomatic work to improve the relations yeah and the fact that this guy, Gori, was now their common enemy and common neighbor, that could have unified them more as well, right? Yes, that, that would definitely contribute to it. Yes. Right. So now Gori has entered the picture. So what happens next? For Gori, I would start, uh, we'll, we'll have to dial back a bit. Um, sure. Gori was in India uh, by 1175 AD. He acquired Multan in 1175 AD. So, uh, I mean, that's not uh, India these days, but yeah, back then it was India. It is historically India. I would still call it exactly. India. <laughs> so exactly. I agree with you, yes. So then, uh, three years later, Shahbuddin Ghori decides to embark on his uh, first campaign into mainland India. And the route that he had planned was uh, starting from the starting from Multan, he would go through the western tip of Thar Desert, and mm -hmm. uh, from there he'll curve east or uh, curve east into the southern Rajasthan, and from there further south into Gujarat. That was his route. Mm -hmm. uh, sensible route, I would say, because you go further north, you have a strong kingdom of Chauhans. You go further south, you suddenly encounter Solankis. So at least to wedge inside, you he basically preferred the route of, you know, straddling along the shallow uh, side of the desert, not going very deep into the desert and uh, going through smaller kingdoms. So there were uh, the uh, there was a Parmar uh, kingdom some, somewhere around uh, I'm forgetting the name. It's a bit uh, west to your Jalor and Nadal side. Uh, then there were there was a small kingdom of uh, another branch of Chauhans, uh, the Nadal kingdom. And after that, there was the Mount Abu kingdom of Parmars. So this was the route which Gauri took. And when the news of the fall of uh, Nadal fort, uh, when that came to the uh, court of Prithviraj Chauhan. So, okay, before that, what Gauri did was when he started, he sent an envoy to the court of Prithviraj Chauhan. And what exactly were the contents of his message for Prithviraj, that part is lost because Prithviraj Vijay, which records it, is 
in a very bad shape. So a lot of verses are incomplete. But you can easily guess the contents of his message from the response of Prithviraj Chauhan. So he says that uh, basically what Gauri wanted was for Prithviraj to come and assist him in the campaign against the uh, these kingdoms. So all these kingdoms which Gauri was you know going through or was about to attack, all of them were part of a Solanki federation. So these uh, Parmars uh, west to Jalor, the Nadol kingdom of Chauhans, the Abu based Parmars, all of them were sort of vassals or fidatories of the Solankis. So this was one whole combined confederation. And all of them were hostile to the Chauhans of Ajmer. So thinking that, okay, Prithviraj could help me, Mohammed Ghori made that proposal that you come and help me in this campaign. They're, they're your enemies only. So Prithviraj says, and this is why his, his, his answer gives us a good peek into uh, what he thought. He says that like my ancestors, I have taken the pledge to exterminate Malachas. Despite this, knowing that Gauri has sent his messenger to me. So basically he's saying that I, I would only fight militias. I'm not one to sort of ally with them for any reason whatsoever. So then Gauri was not one to stop. So his campaign went on anyway. But then once the news of the fall of Nadol reached the court of Prithvira Chauhan, he basically stood up in anger and he said, okay, this is enough. It is time to you know, crash this guy into sand. We need to finish glory. Now, we need to remember Prithviraj's kingdom was not the target of Gauri's campaign, one. Number two, the destruction or plunder which happened in the course of this campaign of Gauri happened in the areas which were all, you know, non-friendly to the Chauhan kingdom of Ajmer. Yet you find Prithviraj Chauhan completely, you know, red in anger and ready to fight and kill Gauri. That he was overridden by his elders who were supervising him, taking a, a short-sighted, you know, political approach that, okay, both are our enemies, be it Gauri or the Solanki Federation, let them fight it out, they will grow weaker, then we'll deal with them. That's better. That's how Prithviraj was overridden. So then uh, after some time, the uh, another news came in the court that, you know, Gauri had been beaten. Uh, near the uh, mountain pass of Kasarad. So th after that, uh, Shabuddin Gauri had learned his lessons that it is not going to work in this route. That lesson was of geography. When we cover the battle of Tarain and then uh, the reasons for why the results were the way they were, at that time, we'll cover about geography or what Gauri learned from that uh, campaign. But then after that, he decided to sort of consolidate his hold uh, where he could. And uh, then he, uh, you know, came to uh, came back to Multan and most of his attention was toward the south. So he raided up to uh, Debal, Debal, which is uh, old, old name of Karachi. So he was basically conquering Sindh alongside the course of Indus River. Okay. So when that was happening, this is around 1182-83 AD. Uh, there were a lot of Hindu principalities in that area, which which Gauri was squeezing. So. Uh, the kings or chieftains uh, of uh, that area, the Hindu chieftains, they go and visit Prithviraj Chauhan uh, as, a as a delegation. And they tell him that, okay, this guy is expanding and uh, we have nowhere to go. So he is killing people, he is killing cows and all, all of that, uh, whatever uh, the Muslims do. Um, so then Prithviraj Chauhan, decides that you know he takes a place that i will 
make this guy bend and beg for his life. And he rides out with his army. Now, again, the matter is of outside his kingdom, right? The problem was not occurring within Prithviraj Chauhan's kingdom. He had been approached by people who were outside his kingdom. This is all narrated in Hamir Mahakavya. Uh, yet Prithviraj, despite the matter, uh, you know, not being of his own kingdom, he rode out with his army, determined to crush this foe. Then what happens is the Battle of Satlaj, 1182-83 AD, where before, uh, I think nine years before the, the, the Taran battles, Prithvi Raj and Gauri have a military contact. So it, it's around the river bed of uh, Satlaj between uh, Multan and Bikampur. So the battle takes place, Gauri is badly defeated and uh, this is where the single pardon of Shabuddin Gauri by Prithviraj takes place. So if at all um, Prithviraj Chauhan had let Gauri go, it has happened only once and not in the first battle of Tarain, but in this battle of Satlaj, 1182-83 AD. And like I said, it was as per medieval norms, if you defeat uh, uh, an enemy king, you may let him go uh, involving any of those three conditions that, you know, tributes or indemnity or taking their land. So in this case, Prithviraj bound Gauri to send regular tributes. And we not only see the Indian texts repeating this, but we also see inscriptional evidence which gives the name of an officer who used to visit Ghazni re regularly to collect taxes. Basically, Prithviraj Chauhan not only fulfilled his pledge, defeated Gauri, but also made him a taxpayer. So initially, it was a, a Sur Singh Parmar who used to go to collect those taxes. And afterwards, it was one of his ministers named Pratap Singh. So these men used to go and collect taxes. So that's how uh, these things happen. Yeah. That is a fascinating story because this is something we don't know about. That there was one more encounter much before the battles of Tarayan, and Gori became a taxpayer. He became a tributary. So why didn't yeah. Prithviraj? I mean, I'm just wondering why didn't Prithviraj just finish him off or go and uh, conquer uh, Ghazni? Why didn't he do do that? I mean, it would have expanded his power significantly, wouldn't it? Yeah. See, um, Prithviraj was. Uh, a lot of people like to project him as a Delhi-based Samrat, Hindu Samrat. Uh, the actual historical facts are a bit humbling. So the Chauhan kingdom was just one of the stronger but middle-sized kingdoms, uh, one of those numerous kingdoms of North India. They were not basically a, a pan-North India imperial power that would command the kind of resources which, with which you can you know, uh, launch very deep and uh, long counter campaigns to conquer uh, areas like that. So that was uh, one of the reasons. Number two, um, it was anyway the, the, the areas that he was uh, acquiring, uh, Gauri was acquiring, those were Hindu kingdoms. And uh, after this battle, like I said, he was anyway engaged with the Solankis in these sporadic battles on his southern front. All over so, again, I see. Yeah, yeah. So I see, I the, see. the Abu engagement, once the Abu engagement takes place, there is a lull. And after about a year or so, then you see the Nagaur battle take, take place between uh, Solankis and Prithviraj. And uh, based on the inscriptions of Solankis, a uh, couple other small engagements are also uh, surmised. So it was basically a, a phase of uh, sporadic wars on and off. But yeah, uh, so that's where he, he, he was busy. And uh, 
I would say resources wise, he was still not ready to, you know, take on the full might of uh, the Gurits because, yeah, 1180s, early 1180s, he was still, uh, Gauri was not so powerful. But by the time you come to the battles of Tarain, if you look at the maps of how big the, the kingdom of these brothers was, uh, you would really say that uh, it's it's a bit of a surprise that Prithviraj could even defeat Gauri in the first battle of Tarang because they basically went from being a kingdom to an empire. If you just have a look at the map, uh, so the, the scales were really tilted by the time of Tarang. And backtracking just a little bit, uh, when Gauri first uh, did his in initial incursion into southern, into Gujarat, uh, he was defeated in 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 the vicinity of Mount Abu, right, by the Solankis. Yes, yes. Kata so was he? Yes. So was he spared there as well by the Solankis, by the Queen? No, he wasn't. So um, he he wasn't spared, but uh, I think I, I would call him a lucky guy, uh, Shahbuddin mm -hmm. Gauri, because. Uh, he gets beaten at Kasarhad and escapes uh, very narrowly, you know, uh, escapes death. Injured, yet escapes death. Then the first battle of Tarang, again he is injured, seriously injured, somehow escapes death. So I, I would say once you can, you can call it chance, but he, he was lucky that he survived two such attempts. Uh, yes, to some extent, we can we can pin blame on our side as well. That you need to be on the lookout for the VIP targets when you're fighting a battle. Uh, that yes. that's what the Islamic armies did. They they trained their uh, you know marksmen, their archers to specifically hit the mahouts and the VIPs sitting inside that howdah uh, on the on the on the war elephants, so that. You, it's like you cut the head of the snake, the, the rest uh, comes under control. So for some reason, we we, we did let these uh, VIPs of the enemy slip time and again. Yeah. That's so mistake, it looks like yeah. there, right, looks like there's a, there's a problem in the strategy, you know, I mean, yes. the strategy should be to take out the head of the snake, like you said, right? <clears throat> yeah. So now this guy Ghori becomes from a, he goes from a king to an emperor essentially the entire uh, territory is like an empire now. So yeah. what precipitates the battles of Tarain? What happened? Was he seeking revenge for what Prithviraj had done to him, humiliation and so on, or did he just want to expand further? Well, I, I would say it could be both. Uh, the Islamic histories, see. Um, they are basically silent about the Battle of Satlej, which which doesn't surprise me much because some of them are even silent about the first Battle of Tarain. So mm -hmm. so there, that, that's no surprise that they are not talking about it. Uh, Alexander invaded India. We all know that. But the Indian history is silent about it. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, these, these kind of things happen. But uh, yeah, his primary motivation so some of the sources, Islamic sources, record that his plan was to acquire up to Hasi, a bit northwest to Delhi. So that that's how much he wanted to gobble uh, on the Indian territory. And uh, so he basically arrived at Lahore and uh, sent a message that you know uh, to to Prithviraj. This is before Taran two that you accept my being a vassal of me and uh, you know accept islam as the religion so then um, prithviraj he had the habit of sending very insulting replies so he completely discarded that proposal and then the second battle of tarain happened the first one similarly he was trying to so at, what used to happen in the medieval era was that uh, a lot of the times, if there is a natural natural boundary available, like a river going through, the kingdoms would invariably default to accepting that natural boundary as the political border as well. And it worked well because there, there is no confusion. Nature takes care of it. 
similarly between the gurids and the chauhans and uh, uh, tomars uh, satluj river was forming the northwestern boundary so gauri wanted to expand up to hasi and uh, that that was just an intermediate objective uh, we we don't know about his uh, final objectives but that's what he wanted to do and both the times he when he gets in uh, crosses satluj he took up the uh, the outpost uh, fort of sarhind that's the first Sorry. fort that he captured both on both the occasions so yeah uh, deep down he might have had uh, some some other reasons like okay i was insulted or i was defeated but visibly the reasons which are recorded in history are are just land grab yeah so then um, what happened what transpired in the first battle of the rhine so i would assume that uh, gauri made the first move he uh, he captured uh, sir hind and then he tried to go to venture further into chauhan territory right and that's when uh, the battle happened yeah yeah so um like i said uh, gauri what he did was uh, he crossed satluj and acquired the outpost of uh, uh, sir hind so once the news reached prithviraj he was not uh, one to take it lying down so he quickly um, prepared an army and and he rode out at that time um, shahabuddin gauri was uh, called back by his elder brother uh, probably there was some some other problems uh, on the northeastern front some other front was open so uh, he was called back so what he did was he left a garrison of 1200 soldiers under a general named uh, ziauddin tulki and he told uh, ziauddin that okay i've been called back i'm going to come back in about 8 months so you hold this fort for 8 months when i come back with better preparation we'll take it forward from here so till this time he hadn't you know captured a lot of land it was just like you know putting a foot in the door he he had just crossed the border and taken an outpost uh, fort so with the arrival of prithviraj's army that news uh, was given to gauri when he was going back from lahore westward toward ghazni so he quickly turned back that prithviraj is coming with an army so both of them faced uh, each other in uh, the field of uh, taran basically taran is not an original name the the village near which this uh, battle happened that village was known as narain and uh, nowadays it is called nidana so so that but then everybody calls it battle of tarain so i don't want to confuse the viewers so let, let's call it tarain only so these two armies are face to face in the field now what happened on the first battle of tarain was that the rajputs uh, stole the initiative they basically charged first and and before we go to that uh, let me let me cover the head count so in the in the battle of tarain um so what normally happens is that in the medieval era every vip general or vassal would typically have uh, their own army okay because that in that era the states uh, would not have a huge standing army under themselves so they they would delegate or decentralize it the armies were mostly decentralized uh, in the medieval era so if you assimilate from the important battles of medieval era even into the mughal rule the general idea that you get is that every such vip which would who would you know uh, have an army and which would be assembled when the king demands that we have to fight a battle that's when they'll all come with their armies so every such division would roughly amount to 10 to 12000 soldiers now the muslim armies which used to invade from the northwest were all predominantly cavalry dom- armies basically they 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 won't have a lot of infantry so 
that's like saying every division would have 10,000 cavalry. On the Indian side, uh, we we did have uh, horses, we did have cavalry, but in the 12th century, it was uh, sort of a, a transition in terms of military composition. So we had a mumbo jumbo of uh, infantry, then cavalry, and a sprinkling of some elephants. So if you look at the composition, it comes down to every VIP or division uh, under him having roughly 5,000 cavalry and five to 7,000 infantry. I so see. then uh, when you look at how many generals or important VIPs are there, with that you can find a, a decent uh, a guess of how many people were there on both the sides. Because if you go with the literal, uh, you know, figures that are given in the texts. Uh, mostly it's the Islamic histories which have spoken about the Tarang battle. They would, you know, tell you that, okay, there were hundreds of rais and lakhs of Hindus coming, thousands of elephants coming and all. Uh, uh, honestly, the kingdom of Prithviraj Chauhan was mostly semi-arid, arid kind of a kingdom. They don't. They they, they didn't. They didn't even have any elephants. It was all imported elephants. So obviously, only few elephants were there, not thousands. But anyway, coming back to the head count, um, it was uh, twenty thousand plus cavalry on the Indian side, twenty five thousand uh, plus infantry, and Gauri had uh, three divisions and a reserve of 5,000 cavalry, so that's 35,000 cavalry. So number-wise, uh, we had an upper hand. Cavalry-wise, Gauri had an upper hand. So now we come back to the field. The Rajputs were, uh, you know, charged first in that battle. So what they did was they made a frontal cavalry dash and kind of collided with the uh, wings of Gauri's army and they enveloped the, uh, both the wings. So this was not uh, done with an impulse, that there was a purpose behind doing it. What happens is these uh, Muslim armies, which come with, the, uh, with their superior horse breeds, they always love to do some uh, maneuvering tactics like hiring tactics or some other cavalry archery maneuvers and all. Their strength was those tactics and their better horses. Now, what can you do to counter that? What you can do is either you develop your own uh, strategies, some something else, or you try to cramp their cavalry, not allow them uh, to kind of maneuver and play their tricks. Okay, So if you are able to cramp the Turkish cavalry, uh, disallow, deny them their maneuvers, then what happens is close combat, man-to-man -man combat. And when the Rajput cavalry had uh, sort of enveloped the Gurids uh, in one mass and they're stuck, this gave some time to the, uh, the, the infantry of Indian army to sort of, uh, you know, charge and match to the main mass of the Gurid army. So now it was all fully muddled. Close combat, man-to-man -man combat, sword-to-sword -sword combat. And that's where the uh, they were able to better the Turks. This was proven not only in 1178, but the first battle of Tarain and many such battles, which is what basically forced the um, 20th century historians uh, like uh, ABM Habibullah, Abu bin Muhammad Habibullah is, is one of the premier historians of 20th century. Uh, he has remarked that in individual fighting, the Rajputs surpassed the Turks. So that's what really happened. The Turkish cavalry was not able to play to its strengths because of Rajputs charging first at them and doing a very violent, daring frontal cavalry dash, which completely trapped them. And one by one, the the wings of Gori, they, they fled. So at that time, you have to give it to Gori that he, he didn't flee. 
so he charged with the center which was still standing under his command and uh, <clears throat> so the vanguard or the haraval the front portion the advance portion of the army of prithviraj was headed by govindaraj tomar also known as chaharpal tomar the king of delhi who was sort of subordinate to prithviraj gauri spots him and attacks him so govindaraj tomar was on a, on his elephant gauri was on a horse so he throws his spear at govindaraj tomar which knocks out his teeth so then govindaraj tomar responds with his own uh, spear which pierces the arm of gauri and uh, he starts bleeding heavily so this is where the islamic histories begin to uh, you know diverge in terms of their details because now uh, the the sultan is injured <clears throat> and we have to write about defeat <laughs> so some sources would say okay uh, a khilji trooper had you know taken up uh, gauri on his uh, horse and he fled with gauri some sources come and say that okay uh, the army fled and then they came back in night looking for gauri and they found gauri injured among the dead bodies they spotted him and they took him away so those kind of stories you you get to hear and uh, after that so th- there are a couple of complaints uh, familiar complaints about uh, this battle or about the battles in general that when we we were victorious why did we not chase why did we not chase and kill the fleeing enemy so the thing is um first of all there was a chase but the chase was roughly 40 miles uh, around i mean it was like um uh, uh, so that that's where the satluj comes in okay so roughly the indian chase <clears throat> behind the gurids in the first battle of tarain was around 40 miles uh, till they reach satluj which is the border so it's not that there was no chase secondly our cavalry like i said was not as good as theirs so the turkish horses were capable of outforcing uh, outpacing the indian cavalry so a long chase in the plains was not going to be easy thirdly we are forgetting that there was a garrison of 1200 gurids mm. still sitting in the fort of sarhind so <clears throat> if <clears throat> sorry if you cross the satluj and continue chasing the fleeing enemy this garrison was going to intercept so that's about the <clears throat> tactical chase uh there's one more complaint which comes as <clears throat> which comes that um, we didn't launch any counter campaigns deep in the gurid territory like the muslims used to come and invade why didn't we invade them deep in their lands again firstly there was this garrison in sarhind capable of cutting our supplies secondly we have to remember like i said chauhans were a middle sized kingdom landlocked by enemies on multiple sides so they didn't have the kind of resources or bandwidth to raise very deep counter campaigns and uh, like like i said if if you look at the distance between lahore and ghazni it is more than the breadth of the entire chauhan kingdom of 1190s mm. the, so that, that's one thing and lastly there are uh, differences of instincts and economies what do i mean by that we were a sedentary agrarian civilization right our enemies from the northwest were nomadic uh, war and plunder based economies so they would simply disperse there was not enough nucleus there to you know fix targets to destroy and be done with okay we have destroyed them we on the other hand had rich cities and temples as static targets and to our people tending to their crops in the fields uh, made more sense than going you know going away in far off lands for months long campaigns d- deep into their territory and uh, compared to the vast plains of north india 
which were very, very conducive for the superior Turkish cavalry. The path to Ghazni is full of hostile terrain and blind spots. If the local population is not cooperative to you, which of course they will never be, there is no way to maintain a campaign. And, uh, you know, uh, it's not just, uh, so it's not just Hindu kingdoms. If Even if you look at the Mughals later on, who raised campaigns into those areas from within India, into Khurasan and Balkh, including Prince Aurangzeb, they got the taste of being on the wrong side of the terrain. All those campaigns were disastrous. So these are the reasons why, you know, these things didn't happen like a long chase or a counter campaign and all of that. Yeah. So why is it that the Turkish horses were better than ours? Were they the mountain breed or were they a Central Asian breed? And what breed did we have? Right. Um, so this is, um, yeah, I, I would say that the horse breeds which were available to our invaders were definitely superior to ours. There are many reasons for that. Firstly, uh, actually horses are a, are a topic which deserve a separate session. But what I can tell you here is that the Indian climate, first of all, was not uh, very suitable to raising or you know maintaining horses. Secondly, uh, like I said, we are a sedentary agrarian civilization with a decent uh, population density. There is a lot of demand for land in terms of agriculture and population settlements. So that doesn't leave you with a lot of uh, empty blocks of land where you can cultivate horse breeds or improve, evolve horse breeds and do stuff like that. That needs a lot of land, a lot of empty land, which you are not using for other purposes. So that's a rarity in India. And uh, but I, I won't say that we didn't have any, because we, I've heard in these days people saying agitatedly, no, we did not have any native horse breeds in India. Uh, actually, we did have, and not as good as theirs, definitely, I would agree, but battle worthy. We did have our own horse breeds. And uh, so that, that's about the horses. And um, like again, to, to conclude on horses, they had better horses than us, better breeds, better climate and uh, areas to, to hone uh, better horses. So yeah, we did our best that we could. We imported a lot of horses, which is very costly. Even those imported studs would not survive often. So it was like, uh, and moreover, the, the Muslim rulers in the Northwest had this habit of uh, denying any uh, import of decent horses into India. So one, one famous example is of uh, Taimur himself. He had uh, enforced a complete blanket ban toward any decent horse breeds going to India. Because obviously then they, they would raise a capable cavalry and he would have uh, problems. And he would himself have fewer good horses. So those kind of things were there. So yeah. That's, That's very I'm interesting. Saying. Right, right. So then what led to Tarain II? Yeah. So the second battle of Tarain, um, after uh, he, he recuperated from the first battle of Tarain, uh, Gauri was determined to basically revenge, take his revenge and uh, settle the score. Um, this time when he, he comes back, he again captures the fort of Sarhind and uh, then uh, Prithviraj basically, uh, he quickly assembles his army and uh, goes to counter Gauri. So what happened this time was uh, the army of uh, Prithviraj in the, the, in the second battle of Tarain was a bit uh, was smaller considerably smaller than the army which went into Tarain first now why was it smaller a uh, couple of generals or vassals which were there with prithviraj in the first battle they were absent 
they, they were not there in the in the battle and uh, which indirectly means that the armies which were always there under the uh, under their command were also not there so there is one uh, source named as uh, uh, Viruddha Vidhi Vidhvans, written by Lakshmi Dhar. He was a descendant of uh, one of the generals of Prithviraj, uh, a Nagar Brahmin named uh, Skand. So he says in his text that uh, my ancestor, General Skand, was busy elsewhere uh, in, I think he, it was some other battle or something like that. And he says that, so for this reason, he could not go into the battle of Tarain. And so that's how Prith- Prithviraj lost. Then there is one more text which is uh, Hamir Mahakavya. Uh, within Hamir Mahakavya, Prithviraj is asking uh, one of his generals named uh, Udairaj to basically come with his army uh, that you know we have to fight a battle in Tarain. But uh, Udairaj does not arrive in time. By the time he he arrives, it was uh, already over. Prithviraj had been captured. So. There, there are multiple you know factors like this which lead us to the conclusion that the army of uh, indian side in the second battle of the rhine was considerably smaller so anyway then uh, what happened this time was when when they they were camped opposite to each other um, basically prithviraj first uh, sent a message to to gauri that you should go back that way you can live otherwise you won't so gauri says that okay i have come here only at the command of my elder brother he's the king i'm not so uh, the the proposal uh, with which uh, i've been sent is that uh, i have to keep uh, you know sarhind and i think he names a few more areas and rest of the hind you can keep for yourself so those kind of negotiations went on and then he says i'll talk to my brother and see what he says so that happens and uh, then uh, at the night gauri tells his people that you should uh, let up the torches at the camp so that uh, the the indians would basically think that we are still in the camp and uh, so then uh, after doing that uh, it it basically tallies with the description in many sources which say that there was line of sight distance between both the camps they they had a, a saraswati channel flowing in between so in the night with those torches lit up to basically give a wrong impression to the indians this army quietly uh, you know circumvented the whole field and came right behind the chauhan camp and right before dawn before uh, they they basically started their attack so what he does is he had divided his army into four divisions 10000 men each which included heavy cavalry as well as uh, the cavalry archers and uh, he had also kept a reserve of 12000 cavalry a few miles uh, northward behind the battlefield that was uh, i think done to give a wrong impression to prithviraj about his numbers so he didn't expose that reserve initially so with those four divisions he first they started to you know uh, basically harass the uh, sleeping rajput camp so the parties of cavalry archers what they do is while moving they would throw arrows empty their quiver and they will go and another party comes in and takes their place that way they were constantly uh, showering arrows at the rajput camp so uh, this basically leads to losses as well as disorientation and you know the the camp is uh, completely disorganized now by the time they organize themselves in proper ranks and everything is done by that time not only they got a lot of losses but gauri had a good idea of okay what is the composition of their army what is their head count and all of that so then he 
uh, went on with a uh, you know full attack and uh, so what happens with these harring tactics is that you can apply the harring tactics at an enemy mass if it is in fewer numbers than yours that's when the harring tactics are successful of which uttarayan second is a good example so when the rajputs realized that this is not going to work it's like you know waiting for your death sooner or later so they they went for a do or die the vanguard in, under the charge of uh, govind raj tomar it directly uh, charged towards the vanguard of gori which was under uh, kharbak uh, that was the name of the general so uh, like i said they were waiting for it so in the interim of tarand 1 and 2 they made all the preparations so so one difference that you observe between the indian side and the gurids in the second battle of tarang <clears throat> is about preparation gurids they basically did a very very good preparation they worked on their weaknesses they and not just that they executed their plan beautifully in the second battle of tarang so uh, they sorted the elephants by you know taking out the mahouts and once the mahout is gone it is it is tough to control the elephant so with the elephants gone they their cavalry was free to operate because what happened with the previous battles was that the the cavalry was basically hampered by the uh, terror which the elephant induces so they they worked on it and they, they devised ways to get around that then the uh, full on battle rages and uh, so this started around the dawn and it had already been afternoon the, the battle was stretching long so then gauri uh, you know decides that okay uh, it is stretching longer than i had uh, anticipated he calls that reserve of 12000 soldiers because obviously by that time the rajputs were completely exhausted and he basically you know by that time uh, govind raj tomar was killed and uh, so with that reserve that fresh reserve of 12000 heavy cavalry gauri basically fell on the uh, tired rajputs and it was uh, finished so that's how it it uh, basically you know uh, happened in the second battle of the rand and what happened is that prithviraj chauhan was captured alive right that's what happened <clears throat> so uh, the question is why did he allow himself yeah. to be captured yeah. what what is so, the reason for that uh, yeah uh, i i'm not really I, i won't say he allowed himself to be captured but uh, so there is a a catch 22 if you daringly you know fight a fight a lost battle you would be condemned for uh, you know letting go of wasting your life you could have lived to fight another day if you try to retreat to fight another day you would be condemned that okay this was a coward who was fleeing yeah. so what i'm trying to say is uh, there there are people who have this tendency to criticize regardless of what you do but anyway so uh, prithvi raj was captured alive and uh, once that happened uh, okay yeah we can come to that when when we have to discuss his demise uh, but uh, other than prithvi raj there there were almost no survivors on our side and uh, if you if you uh, pinpoint the date of the second battle of the rand it comes as march 1st 1192 ad why why am i coming to the date because it gives an interesting reason which probably contributed to the result the battle was fought on the day of holi the festival of holi now we, we know that there are festivities at the night there is ritualistic consumption of uh, cannabis bhang and all it's likely that some of the rajputs may have taken cannabis in the night and once you do that it's uh, easy to guess what kind of fitness and alertness 
those soldiers would have uh, in front of a surprise gorilla attack why am i uh, going in that angle uh, that tangent is we can clearly see there were some gaps in the vigil at the chohan camp otherwise why would you let you know a surprise attack take place and uh, then there are some other wider reasons like you know not having proper scouts if gori had hidden a reserve a few miles north why did the scouting parties of chauhans not spot that reserve and give time the intel so there are a lot of things like that uh, but uh, yeah so prithviraj chauhan was uh, captured alive and uh, gori basically uh, took him to ajmer and so this is where we have to gain some insight into gori's uh, policies as well so he was not like a hot headed war mongering person he had enough of politics in him his priority was to ensure that the transition of power when he acquires new areas in india is as smooth as possible so his his preference was to have a local king as a vassal under him that's what he wanted to do first which is why he did not uh, kill prithviraj on the field of tarain he brings prithviraj as a captive to ajmer and he tries to convince prithviraj that okay you can live you can still have your kingdom just under me accept uh, being a vassal of me accept islam and then you can have everything back as as a vassal of mine uh prithviraj of course said no then uh, there was torture which can be confirmed from multiple sources uh, he is he is uh, shown as blind uh, despite that he did not uh, basically agree to it so then eventually uh, gori had him killed because uh, prithviraj was uh, caught trying to you know Uh, net up a plan to kill gori and this uh, this is not just uh, prithviraj raso but the muslim sources also hint towards it so he was not only not cooperating in captivity he was trying to kill gori by one way or the other so that's why to you know preempt any any such risks or possibilities he uh, gori basically ordered to to you know kill prithviraj chauhan so his approach was initially to have him alive and have him as a king under uh, gori himself which is why there is a joint coinage of uh, you know there, there is a, there are hindu motifs on one side and then there are muslim motifs on the other side a joint coinage under which uh, gori, under which king gori, uh, under gori only so Uh, there, there are some coins of uh, gori which uh, come up as a, a joint coinage meaning on one side it would have uh, gori's name and on the other side there are hindu motifs in the nagri lipi then gradually you would see that uh, there are islamic motifs on both the sides uh, of the coins the uh, the script is still nagri and lastly there are coins with uh, fully islamic motifs on both sides and the script is arabic so what you see is a gradual phasing in the coinage where initially it comes as a joint coinage and then completely islamized now why did they do it they did it to again like i said uh, ensure a smooth transition so that there is no economic shock there is no confusion or possibility of a rebellion or anything like that so that what, what i'm trying to say is that he he was not just someone who would only fight wars he basically knew how things were different in the political galleries how they were different from battlefields so th- that's why prithviraj chauhan was not killed immediately on the field of tarain so he was brought to ajmer and that's where he died and this is confirmed by uh, two of the earliest islamic histories as well as two of the earliest indian histories on indian side you would have uh, prabandh chintamani which is a jain text uh, 1304 ad 
and then there is a kanyanayani uh, mahavir pratima kalp another jain text uh, early 13th century both of them confirm that he was killed in ajmer on the persian uh, uh, the sources there is a tajul masir and jawami ul hikayat of i think molana ufi probably if I'm, if i'm not wrong both of them written barely few years after uh, the battle of taran so all four of the closest sources to the battles of taran converge us to the same conclusion that prithviraj was uh, taken to ajmer and that's where he died yeah so what happened after he died to his kingdom to his people so was it that they all came under the suzerainty of uh, gauri yes so after uh, prithviraj had died gauri basically uh, handed over the kingdom to his minor son yeah, prithviraj minor son. yes he was he was uh, govindraj chauhan the fourth so okay. he he basically coronated uh, govindraj chauhan the fourth on the throne and uh, then he he went away now we have to again uh, come back to the younger brother of prithviraj chauhan hariraj chauhan who had not uh, for some reason unknown reason not participated in the second battle of tarain which is how he survived so hariraj chauhan once gauri went away uh, installing qutubuddin abak as the boss his man in india uh, so hariraj chauhan saw the opportunity and he comes in and dethrones his nephew govindraj chauhan because obviously it was a compromise with the malayche power and govindraj was to operate under gauri's order or qutubuddin abak's order so not accepting that hariraj chauhan uh, you know dethrones govindraj uh, his nephew who fled to ranthambor and ranthambor was to gradually develop into an important uh, chauhan center of resistance for for centuries to come so then hariraj chauhan having acquired ajmer he he could not rule there for long maybe a year or two at best and uh, eventually uh, qutubuddin abak surrounded him in ajmer and uh, he was uh, he seems to have taken his own life because he had pledged that he would never see the face of a of an of a muslim again so when he was completely surrounded he took his own life maybe because he i think he had seen what happened to his brother so he didn't want to meet the same fate so yeah that's where it happened and then through the son of prithviraj chauhan the ranthambore line of uh, chauhans they uh, you know uh, they survived and they ruled from ranthambore and not just ruled they basically <clears throat> resisted muslim powers the the slaves whom gauri had uh, left he didn't uh, he had a lot of uh, slaves with whom he was uh, very close so not just abak but khiljis and all those guys so uh that that's what happened so the slaves of gauri who inherited his uh, his kingdom in india with them the chauhans of ranthambor kept clashing you can uh, take the example of vag bhat chauhan and then hamir dev chauhan and uh, other than that there was one small chauhan branch in chandavar in up they also resisted a lot against the muslim armies and if if you if you check the sources of that of that time they record the uh, the leader was i think bharatpal chauhan is written as bhartu chauhan so the islamic histories are very very bitter when they record of bhartu chauhan because according to them he had killed you know a large number of uh, muslim uh, people in the armies uh, during his resistance so uh, what i'm I trying see. to say is the re- resistance was uh, immediate as well as long term in the aftermath of taran immediately after taran uh, the fort of hasi was sieged by a chauhan uh, officer and qutubuddin abak had to rush 
by do <clears throat> by doing a forced night march to save hasi otherwise hasi would have fallen it would have been taken back by the uh, chohans so there was serious serious challenges after um, hariraj chohan had retaken ajmer for some time his raiding parties had reached up to delhi so there was a lot of back and forth going on between uh, this thing uh, the gurids uh, and muslims and the chohans and uh, I, this is the reason I why i i don't like to you know over criticize Prith- prithviraj for his problems because like i said initially prithviraj has happened to sort of you know defeat his enemies and yet let them you know live they they escape and eventually outlive him now if you look at gore's policy he he used to leave india as swiftly he would enter india what i'm trying to say is that his approach was not thorough and by not having a thorough approach he let the his enemy forces which was chauhans and other rajput kingdoms of the north survive with a lot of intact power and that is how the decentralized and constant resistance against the muslim powers during the turkish era could take root because if he had been thorough after his victories against prithviraj and jaichan if he would have properly and thoroughly dismantled the clans then this resistance could not take place so the there are plenty of problems with the approach of gori as well yeah i see right so now one more question uh, is there any truth to the story of sanyogita was prithviraj chauhan married to this uh, to this lady uh doesn't seem that way to me uh because uh, there is no mention about any princess called sanyogita to have interacted with prithviraj or you know a marriage or anything like that except the raso prithviraj raso and prithviraj raso has been dated to the genesis is somewhere in 15th century but it begins to come in the mainstream only in the 16th century ad so raso basically if you see it stands four centuries away from the events that it narrates and uh, then like i said uh, no other source of history talks about any such princess sanyogita to have married uh, prithviraj chauhan there is one uh, vague mention which has been used by a couple of historians what has happened is that uh, the part where prithviraj vijay the incomplete text uh, available text of prithviraj vijay abruptly ends somewhere there there is a there is a verse which says that uh, <clears throat> so it's a sequence of verses what's happening is that prithviraj chauhan is visiting his royal gallery and is looking at a painting of a heavenly nymph in apsara and he is sort of attracted to her really charmed and he is inquiring like who is she or uh, things like that so then the poet tells him that sir this heavenly nymph has taken birth on this planet and she is at a city on the bank of ganga nag nadi tat sthit on the bank of ganga she has taken birth to unite with you uh, so then uh, the some of the historians including shri dashrath sharma and belvankar they surmise that you know this must be the sanyogita who was the princess of kashi on the bank of ganga the the daughter of jaichand that's quite uh, a leap of imagination isn't it yeah and and my my problem uh, with that is this whole narration which is happening in prithviraj vijay if you look at the sequence of events and where it is placed those verses <clears throat> it's right after the gurid invasion of 1178 ad okay so that means this whole discussion of prithviraj being attracted to a portrait and the person taking birth and her identity has been revealed that okay she is so and so at such and such even if we assume that it is kashi princess 
that has happened in 1178-79 AD. The identity is revealed. The Sanyogita narrative falls between the battles of Tarain in 1190s. That is when Prithviraj meets Sanyogita. They, you know, uh, sort of uh, talk to each other or say that, okay, uh, I'll, I'll take you away. Uh, and Sanyogita says that I want to be with you. That whole thing, he carries her away and all of that, which is going to come in the movie. That whole thing happens in 1190s. How do you explain the gap of 12 years in between? At least 12 to 13 years. So it doesn't make sense. So Which is why I, like I said, I, I won't say it is impossible uh, to have happened. And I won't say it is a historical fact. So according to me, uh, it is inconclusive and I, in my personal opinion, it doesn't seem to have happened. So to conclude, I would like to ask this. In your assessment, should we consider Prithvira Chauhan to be a great king? Is he worthy of being called a great king? Of course. Uh, yes. See, um, the way I see it is he, first of all, the characterization about Prithviraj is that you know, he was he was just bothered about his own kingdom. He kept on fighting with his neighbors all the time, or he was fleeing from the battle and things like that. Uh, to me, he was a nationalist. How was he a nationalist? He was ready to fight when Nadal fell, not his kingdom, enemy area. He refused the offer to help in conquering the enemy areas, an offer from a Malich. Then he was asked to help uh, and uh, he went on to fight the battle of Satlej. Okay, so that gives me plenty to conclude that uh, he wasn't a man devoid of nationalism. Then number two, uh, policy wise, uh, he improved his relations with the Tomars. Despite having an upper hand, he concluded a treaty with the Solankis. So that tells me he was pragmatic around his policies as well. Then lastly, when he was uh, captive under Gauri in Ajmer, till the end, he kept on trying to turn the tables on Gauri. He did not concede defeat. And uh, he was offered to pretty much save his life and his kingdom if only he would accept being a vassal of Gauri. He did not accept that. So he was firm on his Kshatri Dharma as well. So I think he, he has pretty much earned that much respect uh, of being a great king. So yeah, that, that would be my response to and what happened to his people after he was defeated and he was killed? Was there any genocide, enslavement, rape, any of that, which typically happens after a Turkic uh, victory? Yeah, so there is nothing to suggest that it didn't happen. Uh, particularly, you know, if you want to read literally something like that written in the, in the texts, you won't find... Uh, about you know rape or anything like that but yes uh, destruction of temples destruction of uh, buildings then uh, general violence plunder all of that uh, would be would be there so there there was the, this uh, a jain acharya was there i'm forgetting his name he was visiting ajmer in 1194 ad that's 2 years after tarain second and they say that the, the Acharyaji had to suffer a lot for two months. The reason being, uh, so he was visiting Ajmer. So they, they say that he had to suffer a lot because the Malachas, uh, they were uh, wreaking havoc in Ajmer. So not just 1192, when he destroyed that uh, Saraswati Kanthabaran college, which was later you know, they called it Adhaidin Ka Chopra and all of that. But 
even two years after the, the second battle of the Rhine, even in 1194 AD, his people were wrecking, you know, destroying Ajmer. So yeah, there, there was plenty of destruction. There is no doubt about that. Yeah. Right. Uh, so Virendraji, thank you so much. This, is, this has been a very enlightening discussion. Uh, my last question to you for today is, are you writing any more books? Uh, not at the moment. Not at the moment. But uh, I've been basically uh, doing some YouTube videos uh, on my channel to cover some of the other controversies around the ancestry of uh, various uh, historic personalities like uh, Meher Bhoj Pratihar right. and uh, Prithviraj Chauhan and all these. So yeah, that's where I'm working currently. All right, sounds great. So thank you once again for this wonderfully interesting and enlightening uh, discussion. I learned a lot personally. I learned a lot about Prithviraj Chauhan and the politics and the geopolitics of the time. So thank you so much. And uh, we will have one more discussion soon. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.